I said I was going to, how many of you like chicken nuggets? Right? So I'm going to share Pastor uh, Keith in this series that we've been in. Uh, if you've listened to him very much, you know that he's a good reviewer. He says things more than one time. And, and, and you're thankful for that, aren't you, when, uh, when, when the minister uh, just says things over and over. Because how many of you know we don't get it the first time? Or the fifth time? Or the tenth time? Or the hundredth time? Yeah, we need to hear it over and over. So I'm going to read just very quickly. I'm not going to comment, I don't think. But here are some nuggets uh, in, a <laughs> in a way of review as we're getting ready uh, to listen to this next part of the series. All right, you ready? My faith should be in the power of God. So we need, we need to check where our faith is, Right? We need to check where our faith and confidence is. And if we've got more confidence anywhere but in God, then we've got misplaced faith. Amen. We've got misplaced confidence. Jesus said, my word was with power. When I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, power is released. The number one way power is released is with words. Nuggets. We're just going through nuggets here. Jesus, the high priest of my confession, works with my words. We fight the good fight of faith with words. The sword of the Spirit. Amen. And uh, when I am willing to hear, the teacher shows up. Ooh, that's a biggie. When I'm willing to hear, the teacher shows up. Amen. Um. When I understand, this is the next week, when I understand that I'm justified or judged by words, I am way more aware of passing judgment upon another person. Malachi 3, the thing that particularly grieves God is what comes out of my mouth. Do y'all remember this, this message? This was week two. Hell is trying to start destruction with people's mouths. Amen. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Amen. In order for death and destruction and hell to have their way in your life, in our life, in, uh, in a church's life, it's going to start with tongues. It's going to start with words out of people's mouths. Amen. So if we can curse and bring hell and destruction, we can bless and bring life and peace. Hallelujah. Who am I complaining about when I complain about those who God has placed over me? Yeah, the answer is the Lord. We are uh, to assign our words to a, do a job. I like when he, when he said that, you know, God didn't just chat. Although it's nice to have conversation with him, right? When we fellowship with him. But he puts his words out there to do a job. To work. Amen. Other people's words cannot direct my life. Boy, this will help us. Amen. By my words, I will be blessed or cursed. Excuse me that I just sniffed in the microphone there. Unbelief hates to hear faith. The spirit of faith is not a complainer. Don't complain unless you want to stay in it. Woo, isn't that good? Don't complain if you don't want to stay in it. One of the most powerful things I can do with my mouth is bless. And the wonderful thing about God in that he has given us a a free will. He didn't make us robots, is that right? We have the right to choose. We have a free will. And God supports my choice to choose my own words. Amen. Amen. Those who argue or picnic, pick, knit, knit, pick, knit, pick. (laughs) Those who argue or knit, pick the power of words or the importance of our confession, who are they mocking and disagreeing with? 
Amen. Amen. So, so we have to realize that, you know, if people say our words aren't important or you make fun of, uh, of what we say and, and, and stuff. I mean, we, all we have to do is open up the Bible. All, nearly all of Proverbs, nearly all of Proverbs is about the words of our mouth. Amen. Amen. So there's some nuggets for you. Did you like those nuggets? Good nuggets. Didn't even need Chick-fil-A sauce with them or anything. Uh, all right, we're going to get into the message tonight, and I, I want to give you a little bit of instruction. We're going to go all the way to the end with the message, and at uh, one point, he's going to say, everybody stand. So we're going to stand when, when he says that, all right? And uh, he's going to continue to minister. He's going to continue to pray. He's going to lead us into a pra- in, uh, praying. And the end of this particular message is about being filled with the Spirit. We're talking about the tongue uh, tonight. We're talking about the words of our mouth. And uh, so if this is something, uh, just get ready. If this is something that you have been uh, desiring in your heart to be filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, hey, tonight is your night. Amen. So we're going to get a lot of good instruction tonight. Are you ready to receive? Amen. So I'm going to pray over the service. Father, we thank you right now that we have the privilege of coming into your house to gather as the body of Christ to to worship you, to magnify you. We thank you, Father, for words from heaven. We thank you for an atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of love, an atmosphere of peace, an atmosphere of with our God, all things are possible. Father, we thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I'm asking you tonight to flood the eyes of our heart with light in the knowledge of you. I thank you, Father, that your word goes forth and it is unhindered in the name of Jesus. And we receive it and we will not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And in the doing, we are blessed. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. That Jesus had manifestations of power, not just talk, not just words only, but his word was with power. Manifestations of healing, deliverance, miracles, power manifestations. And we see that that the power manifested in direct connection with what he said. His words were connected to the release of the power. When he spoke, these things happened. In Luke, the fourth chapter, and the 22nd verse, it says, All bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. So, they were caught, uh, their attention was caught by the words he was speaking. Verse 32, verse 32, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Now, astonished is a strong word. Not just intrigued, not, ju- not even just surprised. They were what? Astonished at what? His word was with power. Said out loud, his word word was with power. power. We see just uh, the next few verses that uh, he, he rebuked a spirit that was in the synagogue there. And verse 36, when they saw what happened, they were all amazed That's a similar word to astonish. They spoke among themselves. They said, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Again and again, you see, they were so taken aback. They were so uh, astonished at when he spoke the power that accompanied his words. Just a couple of verses later in verse 38 and 39 is when they besought him for Peter's 
mother-in-law, and he stood over her, verse 39, and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And we noted Jesus is not praying here. He's not talking to the father about this situation. He's not talking to uh, Peter's mother-in-law. She's delirious with fever, I suppose. And yet he's talking to something. What's he talking to? The fever. Now, most church-going people don't think that way. It, it, most church-going people, if, if they said, man, I've been, I've been running a high fever or my child has been running a fever, is the first thing that the people around them say, well, have you spoken to it? No. <laughs> That's not how most people think. But should we? This is how Jesus did it. Now, immediately you say that, people will say, well, yeah, but Brother Keith, that's Jesus. And the implication is he could do that because he's God. And that implication is wrong, according to him. He is God, but he emptied himself, the Bible said. He laid aside his mighty weight and power and glory. He didn't stop being God, but how could he do that? How could he lay aside his power of God? Well, he's God. He can do things <laughs> that you couldn't understand. And the scripture said in Philippians, he became like other men. Well, then he, then he said in John 14, if you believe on me, the works I do, you'll do also. Well, if he did them as God, how can I believe that? But if he did them as a man, anointed with the Spirit, and He would anoint us with the same Spirit and give us the authority of His name. We can see the glorious possibilities of us speaking to things like He spoke to things. He rebuked that fever, and the Bible said it left her. So the fever must have heard Him, and the fever obeyed Him. Wonder if we should be talking to some things. Huh? If you got a body part that's not working right, talk to it. Amen. Somebody say, well, you mean talk to my kidney? Yes. Liver, lungs, heart, blood, knees, ankles, talk to it. Tell it what to do and call it what it needs to be and become. Didn't the Bible say in Joel 3.10, let the weak say, well, if you're weak and you look weak and you feel weak, how, would, how is it okay to say I'm strong? <laughs> well, you're obeying the Bible. You're not lying. You're not saying you look strong. You're not saying you feel strong. You're not saying the test results say you're strong. You're calling it strong so that it becomes what you're calling it. Call it healed. Call it cleansed. Call it restored. Call it strong. Call those bills paid. Yes. Call those debts paid off. You, right? Yes. Call yourself smart. Yes. Yes. Huh? Now, you, now you're laughing, but people are, you know, they go, well, you know, I just can't remember things like I used to, you know. I'm, I'm 40 years old now, and... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you forgot things when you were 14. <laughs> this is nothing new. That's right. well, I'm just getting old and forgetful. If you say so, yeah. it will get worse. But it doesn't have to be that way. I had an, uh, uh, an aunt who was 103. And uh, her memory was amazing. I mean, if you ever wanted to know anything about the family tree, you'd just go ask her. And she'd sit there and go, well, now that was Sally's boy. <laughs> and you know, Sally was such and such girl, was married to such and such. She'd take you back five generations. Wow. 103. That's amazing. <laughs> So you don't have to lose it. 
If you had to, everybody would. One of the biggest problems with people's mentality is their mouth. I want you to say it out loud. My mind mind is my mind. mind. It'll be sharp sharp and useful and and fully functional functional my entire life. life. I will never never lose my mind. mind. Someone says, well, you know, none of us want to, but you know how... How can you say that, Brother Keith? Some other really good people have. Well, I don't know what they said and believed, but I know that according to Deuteronomy 28, losing your mind and being crazed in the wits is part of the curse of the law. And I know according to Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, and I've even been given the mind of Christ. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a and a, and a sound mind. Your biggest enemy in this area is fear. Because your fears will come on you. So, so yeah, but I'm just afraid what happened to mama will happen to me. You better get that fixed. I said, you better get the, what do you mean get it fixed? You got to quit being afraid of it. You got to feed your spirit on the word of God until faith arises and it pushes the fear out of you. And one thing you can do immediately is get your words on it. Like what we just did. You put your words on it. My mind is my mind. It'll be sound. It'll be clear. It'll function well. My entire life. And I will never lose my mind. I don't have to. Right? And is God able to keep you or not? Are you more used to him with a sharp mind or losing your mind? You lose your mind. What use are you to him on the earth? What can you do for him? No, it's never the will of God for us to lose our mind. A lot of people have. I know that. But think about what uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 91. He said, a thousand may fall at this side. Ten thousand may fall over here, but it won't come near me. How can you say that? How can you say that? Well, it's written right there in Psalm 91. If it's in the Bible, I should be able to say it. If I can't say the Bible, what can I say? And if you say, well, you just never know, brother. You just never know. (laughs) But I know that talking like that and fearing opens the door. And your fears will come on you. And so I I need to, and you need to, every time it comes up and something tries to scare you or shake you or put fear in you, it's time to reach down and believe something. Is that right? right? And say something. Is it true that life and death is in the power of the tongue? Is it true? That's what the Bible said. Thank God. He is able to keep us. No matter what. No matter what runs in the family. (laughs) You're in a new family now. Is that right? The family of God. And you have Jesus. DNA. And that's some top quality DNA. That's that's flawless. Oh, somebody say praise God. Praise God. God. Hallelujah. Uh, Go with me, or they'll put it on the screen for us. John 6. John 6, 63. Jesus made this statement about his words. We know his words were with power. We know when he said things, people were healed. People were delivered. Miracles happened. And yet we need more understanding into why that was if we're to walk and follow his example. John 6, 63, Jesus said this, it's the spirit that quickens. Now the word quicken 
could be translated make full of life. To make full of life. To be quickened is the opposite of dying. It's the opposite of death. The Spirit uh, quickens or makes full of life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you, they are what? Spirit and they are life. So here we got some insight into why the words were powerful. They were spirit words and they were life words. I mean the gospel is called the word of life. And the preaching of the good news is called, you know, preaching words of life. His words, he said, their spirit, as opposed to what? He, he contrasted with flesh. And so there's flesh words that are empty and powerless. And then there are spirit words. And spirit words that are inspired by the Holy Spirit have life in them. And they make a difference. They are not useless. There is, there are so many useless words spoken in the world. Just empty, nothing words. That's why there's no power in them. There's no life in them because they're just flesh words. Inspired by the flesh, coming from a place of the flesh, talking about the flesh and the natural, and the flesh does what? Prophets? Nothing. That's why the Bible talks about vain words, useless words. But Jesus' words were spirit words. Hallelujah. Somebody say spirit words. Spirit words. Now, in order to speak spirit words, we have to learn where to speak from. And we must get in control of our words. Most people's mouth on the planet is a runaway train. You know, I, I, uh, I saw a, a little sign one time that says, help, I'm talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> I just keep talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> that is not far from the truth. <laughs> uh, a lot of people, when they get nervous or uncomfortable, they just start talking 90 miles an hour. That's a bad habit. I said, that's a bad habit. Because you are for sure going to say some things you should not say. Hmm? And if you're quiet and control your words, and you realize later, I could have said something, you can come back usually and say it later. Not always, but oftentimes you can. But if you say a bunch of stuff you shouldn't have said, how you take it back? You can't unsay it. Huh? You can apologize for it, but they still remember it. Huh? Are y'all awake? In the book of Proverbs, uh, they'll put it on the screen for us. Proverbs uh, 21 and 23. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Whoso keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Anybody believe that? Huh? Can you, can you save yourself a lot of trouble? By what? Keeping your mouth. Keeping your mouth. The, the complete Jewish Bible says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Out of trouble. 
The uh, Ephesians 4.29, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Let how much corrupt communication come out of your mouth? No corrupt, none. How do you do that? How do you, do you get it down to none? <laughs> no corrupt communication. Listen to Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10 and 18. 10, 18 says, He that hides hatred with lying lips and he that utters a slander is a fool. Why would that be? Well, every word is a seed. And if you're slandering and cursing and you don't repent, that's going to come back on you. You're going to get to reap some of the same. So you're really, you know, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Only a fool does that. Verse 19 in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. But he that refrains his lips is wise. If you're, if you're constantly talking, you or I are going to constantly be sinning. In the multitude of words, there's no want or lack of of sin. James talks about if you don't miss it in what you say, the same as a fully developed, uh, spiritually mature person. King James says, perfect man. But he that does what? Refrains his lips. Re we, we would probably say restrain or control. Does the Bible admonish us? To control our mouth. Not just once. Not just twice. I'm giving you just a couple. But we could spend the whole time this morning. Just verse after verse after verse after verse. There are many. If there's a constant stream of words coming out of my mouth. I will be missing it. Continually. But if I refrain my lips, if I restrain myself, if I control my mouth, I'm wise. And the scripture said, I, I keep myself out of trouble. The one we just got through reading before this. In uh, Peter, put that up for us, please. First um, Peter, I believe it's the third chapter. 1 Peter 3, he's actually quoting from the psalmist, 1 Peter 3, 9. He said, don't render evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, uh, knowing that that's what you're called to, to inherit a blessing. That's why he that utters a slander is a fool. Why? Because you sow slander and cursing, that's what you're going to reap, is slander and cursing. And so you don't want to, if somebody curses you, no matter what you feel like or what you feel about towards them, if you don't want a big bumper crop of cursing, you don't need to curse them back. You need to send what you want to reap, right? Which is why you do good to people that do bad to you, if only for personal reasons, <laughs> right? That you don't want to reap. What they're going to reap if they don't repent. Because we are called to inherit blessing. And so if you're a blessing reaper, that means all you're interested in sowing is blessing. Not railing, that's chewing people out. Not evil for evil. Verse 10, verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days. Let's just stop right here. How many want to see good days and you want to enjoy life? Huh? Is this a secret? Is this a revelation of how to make it happen? Do what? Let him refrain his tongue from evil 
and his lips that they speak no guile. That's a quote from Psalm 34, 12, and 13. He's quoting, Peter's quoting the psalmist. Psalm 34, 12, and 13 says it the same way, similar. What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? So now we get the fuller picture. He's talking about quality of life and he's talking about longevity. Hmm? We, you know, th there, there's a lot of talk about being able to live long and there's a lot of emphasis on diet, uh, mineral and vitamin supplements, uh, you know, a lot of different things. And there, there is some truth in that, but we should be so much more focused on what's coming out of our mouth than what's going in our mouth. And that's not something I said, that's something Jesus said. I said we should be so, if you want to live a long time, if you want to be healthy, and you want to have a good quality of life, and you want to have a long life, you should be so much more focused on what's coming out of your mouth than your diet. According to the Bible, Hmm? Didn't he say, what man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good, that he makes sure he exercises properly and has the, the proper nutrition? Could he have said that? Could he have emphasized that above other things? I'm not saying that's not important. Right. That's a factor. It's not the only factor. Right. There are people that have worked out all the time and been so conscientious and died at 28. Right. Right. Yes. Huh? Yes. It didn't automatically cause them to live long. It's a factor, but it's not even the biggest factor. The biggest factor is what's coming out of your mouth. Y'all awake? Yes. Do we believe the Bible? What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Who will volunteer for this? Enjoying life, having a good life, and, and a lot of days. Who, who will volunteer for this? Huh? Okay, read the next verse. Here, here's how you get it. Here's how you get it. It'll be one of the most challenging things you ever did. Huh? It's actually a lot easier to go on an extreme diet. I'm telling you, or an extreme exercise regimen is a lot easier than this. Hmm? But this works. This will get results no diet or exercise can get. This will change your organs. This will change the structure of your brain. This will, this will deliver you from any kind of inherited traits. Are you listening or not? Yes. This, this can do miraculous things. Amen. Keep your tongue from evil. Now evil, we'd say bad. And keep your lips from speaking guile. Guile has to do with any kind of dishonesty or deception. So you got to tell the truth all the time. Y'all awake or not? Yes. Huh? I said you got to tell the truth. All the time. So I've heard people say, well, now, don't make me lie to you. Hey, it ain't an option. If you're serious about being a believer, lying is never an option. There is no truth worse than a lie. I'm talking about a truth that you have to admit to somebody. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. So how do we do that? How do we do that? James, you know, talked about uh, in James 1.26. James 1.26. If any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. This is one big statement. Listen to the NIV. 
If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Is this true? The Good News translation says it a similar way. Uh, do, do any of you think you are religious? If you do not control your tongue, your religion is worthless and you deceive yourself. These are big statements. Big statements. In the third chapter, you know of James, he goes into detail about the tongue. He compares the power of the tongue to a bridle and bit in a horse's mouth that you can steer the horse with it. He compares the tongue and mouth to a rudder on a ship that you can steer. So our, uh, according to the Bible, according to James, our mouth and what's coming out of it steers our life. Our words are steering our life. Most people don't believe that. But that's what the Bible says. You can tell most people don't believe it by the way they talk. Because if they believed what was coming out of their mouth was steering their life, if they really believed it, they would change it. And we've all made mistakes. All of us have made so many mistakes in what we've said. But can we change? How do we get control of it? In Mark 16, Turn, turn with me to a couple of these now. Mark 16, the last chapter of Mark. You'll find him talking about the Great Commission. You'll find him talking about what it means to be a believer in this time and age of grace, the time we live in now. And Mark 16, 17, he said, These signs will follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Yes. Then these things ought to be occurring in your life. In my name, they shall cast out devils. That's the word for demons, wrong spirits. Is that your word having power? Yes. The word of authority and power. And that's, that's not talking about Jesus having it. It's talking about a believer having it. Right. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Coupled with exercising authority, saying words that shut down the enemy and drive out the enemy, the, it's not even the end of a sentence. The rest of the sentence says, they shall speak with new tongues. What's, what's that got to do with that? They are connected. I said they are connected. You will find... All the gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning the spirits, uh, faith or special faith, working of miracles, you'll find all these things in the Old Testament. You'll see them in the ministry of the prophets and others, except tongues. And interpretation. That is distinctive of our age, the church age. Why? And it's something the enemy fights. Oh, most church going people don't believe in speaking with tongues, do they? And scoff and mock at those who do. And if you're visiting and say, well, do you know anybody that do? Yeah, you're amongst them. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we are tongue talkers. But what, what do you mean? The language is speaking in the spirit. That's the language. Now, some have tried to take that and say, well, no, well Brother Keith, that just means, you know, Praying with intensity. No, it does not. You got to interpret scripture in the light of other scripture. And when it talks about speaking in another tongue, it's not talking about that your language is cleaned up and you don't cuss anymore. 
or praying or speaking in the Spirit, that doesn't mean that you're speaking with great intensity. It means you're speaking in a language that the speaker does not know. That's what it means. And that's not just my opinion. There's scripture after scripture after example after example in the New Testament. The reason people try to make it something else is because they themselves don't speak with tongues yet. And so what you don't understand, what you're not up on, you're down on. But this is for every believer. I said for every believer. Now if you think, well I don't know if that's right or not, don't Run away. Listen to the, the, we we have a lot of teaching on this. There's a lot of resources. Go through the scriptures one by one. Don't just think, well, I, I don't know if I believe that or not. Find the scripture. Go through it. Let it convince you. I was a believer for years who did not speak in other tongues. Now I've been a believer for many more years who does speak with tongues. So I'm qualified to talk about both sides. And I can tell you unequivocally, with is better, much better. So if you don't speak in tongues, then you don't know anything about what we're talking about. So don't just shut it down and cut it off. I struggled to receive. I thought wrong. But thank God the Lord helped me to to get there after a period of time. It's as easy as can be. But I'm not just trying to convince you or anybody else that this is for us today only, why would the Lord give us something like this? Why? So say it out loud. Believers, Believers shall, shall speak, with new speak with new tongues. Go with me to the book of Acts, second chapter, verse 1, Acts 2, 1. Let's remind ourselves of what happened. You remember what Jesus said after he had raised, was raised from the dead? He appeared to the, to the disciples and the apostles. A lot of people saw him. Hundreds of people saw him for numerous days. He ate and drank and had meals with people after he was raised from the dead. But then he told them, you know, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not will be condemned and judged. But then he said, but wait. Wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power. He said, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come on you and you'll be witnesses to me here and in a broader and broader circle. So are we talking about power? You can't talk about power without talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit. So we, uh, they're spirit and life. And so we got to distinguish between empty, powerless uh, flesh words or life-filled spirit words. And so when the Lord was raised from the dead. He said before he ascended, he said, all authority in heaven and in earth is given to me. And then the very next thing out of his mouth, so you go, you go into all the world and preach the gospel. And among other things, these signs will follow you You'll have authority over spirits. You'll lay hands on the sick. They'll recover. You'll speak with new tongues. Is he saying that the authority he has, he's delegating to his church and sending his church? Then he's expecting us to speak. How can I exercise authority over spirits and disease unless there's some power in these words? Authority and power. And so I must, you must, in order for the Lord to have people that are doing this in the earth, we must not be speaking just empty flesh words. We must be speaking quickening spirit words. Hallelujah. Say it out loud. Speaking Speaking 
Spirit, Spirit. Words. words. And so on the day of Pentecost, so they did what he told them before launching out into fulfilling this great commission, before launching out into acting on this commission and authority, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all there waiting, one accord, one place. And there came a sound from heaven, suddenly, like a rushing of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And if you read the rest of the chapter, it's clear they're not just speaking nice things that are not cussing. Different, uh, there's a list of people that said, how do we hear them in our language? Because they knew they didn't know the language. So they're speaking languages that the speaker does not know, did not know. Why? Why is this needful? Why did the Lord do this? Because getting a hold of the tongue, <laughs> yielding the tongue to the Spirit is one of the biggest issues of submission to His Lordship and walking in power. James talks about the, the, who can tame the tongue. None of us can tame another's tongue. And we even need help taming our own. I got full agreement across the, the group. I said, we even need help. And God gave us help. He gave us help in the form of receiving the Holy Spirit and yielding our tongues. Oh, come on, can you see this? Yielding our tongues to Him begins to train us to speak spirit words. Not just flesh words, but speak right out of our spirit. And the more we learn how to do that, the more power is going to accompany our words. Go to 1 Corinthians, please, the 14th chapter. 1 Corinthians 14. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I could use another hour. Can, uh, can you come back next week? 1 Corinthians 14. Now, now chapter 12 talks about what we'd call the gifts of the Spirit or the manifestations of the Spirit. I mentioned some of them earlier. Uh, working of miracles, gifts of healings, faith, special faith, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, prophecy. But none of those are we given an entire chapter on its operation. None of them. Why? Because we have the most to do with this one. We, we have the most involvement with our tongue. Because if we don't yield our tongue to him, it won't happen. He's not going to take us over. The Spirit of God is not going to control us and speak through us against our will. It's a yielding the tongue to Him. Anybody remember how you got born again? How'd you get born again? How? According to Romans 10, 9, and 10, right? If you will believe in your heart that, that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And if you'll do what else? What else? Confess with your mouth. Why? If the Lord doesn't have your tongue, he doesn't have you. Y'all with me, church? And this is the big deal. 
People who won't confess him as Lord, he does not have. They are not his. And it's their choice. The way, if it's true, if the tongue is the steering wheel, then in order for him to be Lord, I have to get off the throne. Huh? In order for him to drive, I got to get out from behind the wheel. What's the steering wheel? My tongue. So how do we begin our life as a believer? How do we begin our walk with God? It begins with two big things. Believing in our heart and then what? We, we've got to yield our tongue to him and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. I submit to your Lordship. I confess Jesus is Lord and he is my Lord. And in doing that, if you do that from a genuine heart of faith, you are born again. Oh, hallelujah. The greatest miracle actually that you will ever receive. You're born again. But that's not the end. That's the beginning. Are we supposed to walk with the Lord the rest of our life? Are we supposed to yield to his lordship the rest of our life? Well, then how do we do it? The same way you got started, you keep yielding your tongue to him. You yield. If he says something, then that's what you put in your mouth. If he says something about you, then you say the same thing about you that he said about you. If he said something about a situation, that's what you say. He, if he's not Lord of your mouth, he's not Lord of you. And the psalm, we, maybe we'll get into this later, but in, in one place in the psalms it talks about, you know, our tongues, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? The ungodly said. No, we don't say that. That's the ungodly. That's the defiant. That's the rebellious. We say our lips are not our own. Our mouth is not our own. We've been bought with a price, right? And we yield our lips and our words and our mouth to our Lord. Come on, somebody say it out loud. Jesus, Jesus is, Lord is Lord over my mouth, over my, mouth. Over my lips. Over my tongue. Over my Jesus, is Lord Jesus is Lord over what I say. say. Now that is a big statement. Right? And if you say all kind of stuff all day and all night, then that's not true. You're not endeavoring to yield your tongue. You're just yielding your tongue to whatever crosses your mind. And the enemy will bring thoughts to you. He'll bring bad things to you and you'll be speaking evil or bad without realizing that you are speaking things that the enemy can act on. But if you want to enjoy life and you want to have a lot of good days, what did he say? Control, refrain, restrain your mouth, and if you start practicing it, then the Lord will check you. Mm, don't say that. Don't say that. So you go, I'm not going to say that. What do I say over that? And you check your heart, and the Spirit of God will prompt you, and you go, that's it. That's what I'm saying. And you say it, and instead of giving the enemy something to work with, you just gave the Holy Spirit something to work with in your life. And because there's so much we don't know, so much we don't know, the, we needed, and the Lord has given us a spiritual means of speaking directly, spirit contact, spirit source, apart from our limited, limited head. Amen. And it's called praying in the spirit, Amen. speaking in the spirit, which is speaking in a language you don't know. 1 Corinthians 14, are you there? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. He that speaks in a tongue, now the King James says unknown, but that's a word that's added. Uh, it is unknown to the speaker. That doesn't mean it's unknown to everybody. 
You remember on the day of Pentecost, there were people who understood what they were saying. They knew the language, even though the speaker didn't know the language. He that speaks in a, a language or a tongue speaks unto men, uh, not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him, how be it in the Spirit. Everybody say, in the Spirit. In the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Do we need to get a hold of our mouths, of our tongues? Do we need to quit just saying a bunch of empty flesh stuff? Do we need to start speaking like the Master? He said, the words I speak are spirit words and their life. Will this help us? You're speaking divine mysteries when you're speaking like this. Thing, correct things. Uh, you know, I, I do this on a regular basis. Uh, when I don't know exactly what to pray about, when I don't know exactly what to say about that situation, I say, Lord, help me. Help me to say what I need to say about this, to declare what I need to declare, to pray what I need to pray, and then I take off praying in other tongues, Amen. speaking in other tongues. And you can tell, I'm sp you get to the place where I'm speaking spirit words, yes. not just empty flesh words. I'm speaking quickening words that are changing things. Sit out loud. He speaks in the spirit. He speaks in the Spirit. Skip down to the 14th verse. 14th verse, if I pray in a tongue, what, what part of your being is praying? My spirit is praying. So this is not just flesh. This is spirit. But my understanding is unfruitful. So then this is obvious you don't understand the language you're speaking. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. That's in words you don't understand. And I will pray with the understanding. That's words you do understand. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding also. And you do all of this by faith. He said, uh, else when you shall bless with the Spirit, with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at your giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what you say, for you verily give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than all of you. He's having to correct them for speaking in tongues at the wrong times. Then he turns around and says, he speaks in tongues more than they do. But not in the church, uh, you know, session like this with no interpretation. So it must have been mostly in his private life. Can you see that? And when he's talking about the tongues that you don't speak in church is the ones publicly without an interpretation. Is this something that belongs to us as believers? He goes on to say, I would that you all spoke with tongues. He said that in this same, uh, same chapter. So have we been given an amazing help and ability in getting a hold of this thing under our nose? Huh? Do we need help getting control of our mouth? Oh, you, just ask your friends. Uh, have you been given help? You have been given and I have been given the church has been given the greatest help that any group of people has ever been given. Let's take advantage of it. Let's yield our tongues to the Spirit of God on a regular basis. Stand on your feet, everybody. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you've never spoken, in other tongues, now's the perfect time for that to happen. If you've spoken in tongues, but you, it was a long time ago and you haven't done so, then uh, you could have been doing this all along, but for whatever reasons you've let it get away from you, let's get it back. Close your eyes and everybody said out loud, Father God, Father God I, believe I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. 
and I confess Jesus as Lord over me. And if he's Lord over me, he's Lord over my tongue. He's Lord over my mouth. I yield my mouth. I yield my tongue to the Lordship of Jesus. And I confess his Lordship. And I see in your word where you gave us your Holy Spirit to indwell us and to quicken us and to give us utterance and the ability to speak in new tongues, new languages, direct out of our spirit by your spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive him. Give me utterance in these new tongues. I speak by faith. I yield my tongue to the Holy Spirit. Now, ole peace, li de moyani, nala costa, felibe adoja, bampri kesca. Don't be quiet. Speak out. Mendele brave on bia man san ka. Will I come bright my antique luck by a chache? Don't speak in English or a known tongue. By faith, don't be quiet. Speak out. By la covoce, vile bremande, lesto tiwala, julafado, quis me camane, biste filaba, nantaka, oshtahoye, hoye. Ho ye, ho ye, mine la mande van baia ka ze mai enik ji, wende le ba be de si di verbe jae bai kai, yishke von yan mangang e tai ka, esse ga e mine ka, eji ba e ninga da, wela pona, wela pona. Oh, vela blay mai angan bai an ka mandaya jande bai o kosu soko, Bijan by a mindila bab dos soga, Bela brain by a tike fee, Liri brai by a cofele braiba, Mindile prai by an inmende zude, Wele ki by a niang chane da chia che, Que, que, disa que, Dush de la bi, Giep mai ainke, Waishne, Kainge, Ishke. Ho chaiwaya hai haiya. Oh, hallelujah. Altar workers, would you come to the front? Oh, somebody say, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. If this is new to you and, and you still got questions about it, these folks are ready to pray further with you, talk with you, answer a question. Uh, my father in the faith, Kenneth Hagin Sr., has um, outstanding materials along this line, How to Receive the Holy Spirit, a little book called Why Tongues. Uh, we don't have those on, on, on our premises, but you can order them off of his website. We also have things as well. You can check through our materials. But uh, do not let this get away from you. How many believe is a big deal that God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Huh? And of all the things he could have done, that's what he did is manifest in tongues of fire and give them utterance and the ability to speak a flow of spirit words. Hallelujah. This is a big deal. Whether you understand it or not, and the enemy hates it. Oh, he hates it. It is the weapon from God that he can't do anything with. And so... Uh, all of us need to be flowing in this on a regular basis. If, you, if you're not sure, got questions, don't stop till you get them settled. The more you get in the Word about this, the more convinced you're going to become. Because it's truth. Because it's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so don't let this uh, uh, get away from you in your regular life. Uh, if you yield your, your tongue to your spirit and him within you, you do this all the time. 
I mean walking around your yard, cleaning the house, doing the laundry, driving the work, and instead of listening to some goofy stuff, turn it off and start singing in the Spirit. Start singing in the Spirit. Huh? And, and, and a lot of the political stuff that's being talked is just judging. Even the people that think they're right are just continually judging the people on the other side. And if you don't watch it, you get full of that. That's what's going to come out of your mouth is judging. And that's not edifying. And it'll sow so some judgment to come back on you. Turn off some of this stuff. Get away from some of this stuff. And get your tongue hooked up to your spirit. Hallelujah. And you'll be speaking quickening words. Life making giving words. Hallelujah. Things that edify. That chapter said if you pray in the spirit, you edify yourself. You build up yourself like charging a battery. Like building a building up higher and higher. Hallelujah. Only works if you do it. Praise God. Well, you're a joy to minister to. I'm so glad to be with you. And, uh, the big thing is that you remember this tonight and tomorrow and the next. Thank you, Lord. Good word. Amen. Within our mouth, we have the ability to speak spirit words, life words. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your written word. Thank you for the spirit of truth that indwells us on the inside We've made Jesus the Lord of not only our lives, but our tongue tonight. Amen? Amen. So we should, this is, this is a way that we, um, that we establish the kingdom of God in the earth. Amen. Amen. We need, we need more than just what our flesh can do. We need more than just what our good intentions can do. We need power from on high. And we're not limited. I said, we're not limited. The God of all power is on the inside of us. And he's given us the ability to bring life to every situation we come up against. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, actually, he talked about some of Brother Hagin's books tonight on uh, tongues, why tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We actually do have those books on our premises here. So, if you have any questions, if you would like uh, prayer uh, agreement for uh, regarding that, just receiving the Holy Spirit, if you still have questions, we'd love uh, to talk with you, to minister with you, and to get those tools into your hands. Don't be content with doing without. Out. We need him. We need him in this day and in this hour. We need him. Don't be content with doing without. No matter what you've heard in the past, no matter what teachings you've had uh, beforehand, he's brought us his word, he's brought us truth. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you tonight. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house. We thank you for the spirit of wisdom and truth. We, we thank you for your good plan that you have for each of us. And we declare over our, our lives, over our families, and over this church body that we will, uh, we will bring your kingdom. We will build your kingdom in our generation hallelujah hallelujah we thank you for it Lord we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your kindness we thank you that our path grows brighter and brighter hallelujah I thank you Father this week as we go that this is a message that doesn't leave us but that you continue to talk to us and talk to us and lead us and guide us uh, I thank you for that, Lord, and that we become stronger and stronger and um, that we are a harvester. We are a harvester in our generation. We are harvesters in this generation for your glory. I thank you, Lord. We ask you that you do put a guard upon our mouth that we are aware that the words that we speak have the ability to establish life 
or death. And so I thank you, Father, that you're helping us. I thank you that you're helping us. And I thank you that we're coming up in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. All right. See you on Sunday.